Hello all, and uh, welcome to the first in a series of programs that Printed Matter is producing in advance of Printed Matter's virtual art book fair taking place February 24th through the 28th of 2021. My name is Sanel Breslov and I am Director of Affairs and Editions at Printed Matter. Thank you all for joining us. I'd like to quickly extend my appreciation to today's speakers, Paul, Paggy, Sapoya, and Wasan Alhaveri. And a special thank you to David Senior and Aperture. We've muted all guests' microphones and asked you to put your questions in the Zoom chat box. If you are joining us through YouTube Live, please add your questions to the comments and we'll be sure to share them with the speakers towards the end of the program. I'll be adding some links now uh, to the Zoom chat box as well as to the YouTube uh, if you're interested in purchasing Paul's newest book, as well as a link to uh, his Exit Paul's exhibition from 2019, curated by Wasan at the Contemporary Art Museum, St. Louis. We're also offering live captions for this program and we'll include that link in just a moment. Uh, please note that this program will be recorded and uh, it will be available on YouTube's, uh, I'm sorry, on Printed Matters YouTube channel tomorrow. This program was originally planned for the LA Art Book Fair 2020 as part of the classroom program. And I'd like to uh, introduce David Senior, Head of Library and Archives at, Archives at SF MoMA and longtime organizer of the classroom series at Printed Matters Art Book Fairs. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, it's been kind of thrilling in some ways um, in this moment to have a reprieve of some of the programs that we thought about in the past that couldn't happen. And even in, the, in, in this context, um, a way to connect out to our community at Printed Matter and um, connect with the authors of the books that we want to celebrate in this way. Um, with this project, um, it seems great to Paul, point out with Paul and Peggy Supuya, um, a figure within the world of photography and contemporary art um, that is, exemplifies some of the things that I like to talk about with my library collection at SF MoMA and previously at MoMA, where I'm a librarian, but I can learn about contemporary art in a strange way through books made by artists and designers and photographers and a certain kind of artists that create space for themselves without asking permission um, with, with seizing on their own self-distribution distribution practices or organizations like Print and Matter to, to make space for their own practice, but also to stage community. And that's something I remember spotting in Paul's work in the early days with Shoot, the zine that he'll introduce in a little bit. Um, and really, and like noticing friends in the pages or just a, a magazine, a zine at once that mapped out a series of personal relations, but also was about um, community in, in a way that repeats itself in various projects that we encounter within the world of print and matter that I, I want to call out. And, and sometimes these figures become part of our canon of contemporary art, but we know where they began in terms of how they tried to do it themselves in terms of printing and stapling these little booklets. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Paul and Peggy Sapuya. Um, I'll do the formal introduction here. He's a Los Angeles-based artist. His book is held, his work is held in the collections of MoMA, Whitney Museum of American Art, Guggenheim Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, among other institutions. Notable recent exhibitions include a solo survey exhibition at Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis, a solo exhibition at Amsterdam's Foam Museum in 2018. It was part of the 2019 Whitney Biennial and being new photography 2018 at MoMA. And we're really pleased to have Wasan al Hudari here to uh, be the, the conversant with Paul. And, and Wasan was, uh, who is the chief curator at the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis, uh, help was the organizer of Paul's show in 2019 and was the co-author of the book that we're celebrating today. Um, 
along with many other exhibitions at the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis. Um, El Hodari was also the Hugh Call Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Birmingham Museum of Art um, as the last position. Um, but thank you to Paul and Wasan for gathering here today and for agreeing to this um, conversation that was supposed to happen be at uh, at uh, LA Mocha's uh, Geffen Contemporary as part of the LA Art Book Fair that never happened. Um, so thank you so much and, and I'll turn it over to you guys. Great, thank you, David. Mm -hmm. um, so Wasan, are, which one of us will begin? <laughs> I think you're going first. Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna begin, um, well, I first wanna say hello to everyone out there. <laughs> These Zoom things are always so um, uh, sort of strange because we're just sort of talking to ourselves here and we can't see all of you out there. Um, so, you know, um, this is really wonderful for us to gather um, because we were, I know Wasan and I were really excited to see each other this past spring out here in LA. Um, so now here we are virtually um, to talk about this book. Um, but I wanted to just begin by thanking um, Wasan and everyone at, um, at CAM, at Aperture, um, particularly Leslie, Leslie Martin there at Aperture, um, folks at the Blaffer Museum, um, and uh, also, you know, just acknowledging the folks who contributed to this book, um, and I'm going to get to a little bit more about about that. Um, to uh, Lucy Gallen, um, Malik Gaines, Ariel Goldberg, um, Grace Wales Bonner, and Evan Moffat um, for contributing um, writing to this book. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm going to save everything else once I go to like a. By my presentation. Um, so I'll hand it over to um, Osan. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. Uh, echo Paul's uh, feelings. It's uh, it's hard to, to talk to you all without seeing you, but um, you know we know you're there. We know some <laughs> of you are there. Um, and so yeah, Paul and I wanted to start tonight with the with sort of just our gratitude and thanks um, to everyone involved with the book. So. Um, I'll just add to uh, the thank yous to the contributors that, um, you know, echo again, uh, our thanks to Aperture. We were thrilled, um, Cam was thrilled to work with Aperture on this project um, to, you know, their ongoing commitment to photography and its role in engaging with contemporary culture made them just the right partner, I think, for this project. Um, the book was produced by Lucia Marquand in Seattle, designed by Tom Eichmann. So we want to say thank you to Tom and his sort of artistic vision um, and edited by my colleagues, Misa Jeffries and Eddie Silva. I wanted to say thanks to them. Um, and the book would not have been possible without support from a lot of people. So thank you to the Robert Maplethorpe Foundation, Document Chicago, Team Gallery, Ville Matter Los Angeles, Hedy Fisher and Randy Schull, Nancy and Fred Posis, Hunt R. Tackberry, Hey Jude and Brian Black, Thomas Levine, Michael Hole. Um, thank you to all of you. And thanks to our partners, the Blaffer Art Museum, where um, uh, Paul's exhibition traveled from CAM to Houston um, to be shown there, uh, which I also wanted to kind of say my thanks. So thank you to everyone who was involved. And thank you, Paul, um, for trusting me to work with you on this project. Um, so. Now to the the content part of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was such a pleasure. Um, it was such a pleasure. So thank thank you. Um, okay, I'm I'm assuming everyone can see me now. I'm going to switch to share my screen, um, and I'm going to try to go through a lot of info and um, background in a short amount of time. Um, oh wait. Sorry, technical difficulty. What is happening here? Let's go back. Wait, hold on. <laughs> this always ha this always happens. Okay. Oh, sorry. This is a thing with this new OS. Okay. 
it's like oh well you're dealing with that um i just i forgot <laughs> to mention in the intro that part of the conversation that will happen later is uh q and a's and so if there's things that come up while paul's presenting or within the conversation that you want to follow up on or ask just drop it in the chat or um and and we'll pick up for the q a and we'll we'll follow up after um the conversation great okay um sorry when i went into full screen it moved it to a I don't know how you say, like a hidden off screen screen. Okay. So I hope we're back. And when yeah. we go to full screen, it will stay. Here we are. Okay. So this is the book um, that uh, that uh, was produced with, uh, with Wasson and, and Aperture and everything. But I want to start by kind of giving an overview of my of various aspects of my practice over the past. Ooh, let's say 15 years relating to um, self-published projects, zines, um, and exhibitions, and the way those have sort of like flowed back and forth. Um, I'm gonna go pretty quickly so um, we can return to anything spe uh, more specific um, with uh, guided by questions from the audience. Um, so I just wanna kind of begin by giving a context to where all of my sort of like zine stuff um, started in about 2005. Um, which uh, kind of came from like what David described, kind of like just trying to take control of, of, of forming conversations. I began making zines using my um, contact sheets, outtakes, and sort of test prints um, at a moment when I was producing a lot of portraits, but I was, this predated any sorts of like um, exhibitions of work for the most part. And so I was using like my Xerox, uh, uh, the Xerox machine at work to make photocopies and of, of my work and staple them and print them and, uh, and, and send them out. Printed matter there in New York, Art Metropole in Toronto, Skylight Books in LA, various places were the first ways in which this work went out. And then it started to circulate through these collaborations and overlaps between this larger kind of like zine culture, um, kind of was like a resurgence of, qu of queer zines in the in the mid 2000s. This was, I think, maybe the second or third uh, moment of the work um, being featured in Butt Magazine, which one of those, which was one of those channels that kind of um, broadened the audience um, in in a way. So I'm gonna go through kind of quickly just some images so you can see what this, uh, what these zines looked like a little bit. Um, so for example, like shoot two was made from a series of 10 photographs that were outtakes when I couldn't decide on one final portrait for this subject. Shoot number three was a collaboration with my friend, um, a writer named Ido Fluke. And we wrote a text that sort of pieced together. Um, uh, it was, an, it was a, a uh, a fiction that he had written about an encounter between two strangers, and that we paired photographs of strangers to kind of create this um, sort of a, a relationship that only existed in the zine together. This is the text called Frank. Um, shoot number four was uh, an extended portrait of my friend Dean, which also featured um, his sort of like, uh, this was a fold out that was in the zine that was like a, a I sort of handed him images and some of the work for him to kind of like just sort of draw on. It also included a short poem by him. These were all very just sort of like, you know, I was trying out a lot of ideas of just sequencing and um, come and uh, being able to play with ideas of, of just what was sort of like a finished work. But also I began really interested in the conversations that grew out of these um, and sort of the community that formed around um, the making of this work. Shoot five was a self um, was a self portrait series. Shoot number six was um, a portrait of two friends. This is sort of a poster view, so you can kind of see how one issue unfolded. Um, and so uh, these are friends, Laird and Jonathan, um, who were both friends and uh, lived in the same building in Brooklyn. Shoot seven was a portrait um, of my friend Christian which also sort of included these images. We were so, sort of photographing each other and sort of kind of like introduced some ideas that would become quite 
prominent later on in my work. And so, you know, there are various other kind of like self-directed like little print projects. Again, this is like a little, uh, you know, a series of little booklets um, that kind of like sequenced an entire roll of film um, in, uh, in, this, in, this little, in this little work. Um, and, you know, I was just making these, it was a really fun process um, and it's been kind of interesting going back through these. Um, but so what ended up happening later on was, um, you know, this is an exhibition, the first exhibition of the portraits from about 2005 to 2007. Um, you can see here, um, beloved object, amorous subject, revisited, which then did become a book. And so this was a book that was published by a gallery that I was working with at a time. And I that was the first time I began working with um, my friend Carl Williamson, who is a designer, and I worked with him on the next um, book, this project, a project Accidental Egyptian, and the Studio Work Project, as well as my friend Felix Berichter as an editor. Um, and they really and working with them as a, a trusted collaborators was really um, helpful for me in doing these projects. I'm going to kind of uh, skip over um, going in depth into into this book, um, but I want to jump on to uh, this this project with um, my friend Timothy Hull, who's a painter in New York, and. It's interesting because this work, this entire book came out of a one day um, collage party we kind of had that was um, kind of um, instigated by a magazine that was asking for two artists who are friends to get together and make um, one new work out of um, parts of, of existing works from our from our archives and we and we got together and we couldn't just make one and so this turned into this really fun pro project process i we worked with these um outtakes and contact sheets of mine portraits um of of a young man named avi and tim's work which was made on um he had been photographing traveling western tourist groups through egypt and observing their interactions with um, with, uh, with this culture. And so we kind of combined these into this project. Um, and it's the, it's the moment where collage entered into my work. And so also it's important to say that um, bookmaking and zine making has been um, where a lot of new ideas are generated. Um, and so all of these collages um, and these spreads, they were made for the scanner. And then those scans were turned into book spreads. Um, and then on to the Studio Museum. Um, in 2010, 2010 to 11, I had a residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem, um, a project that um, eventually became known as Studio Work. And I produced a zine for it as a way to um, work through some ideas as it was not yet finished. It's kind of hard to explain, but and it's interesting because I've never shown installation views of the first iteration of studio work, but it was this moment where over the course of a 12 month residency, I had this um, deadline to produce an exhibition that was like right at the middle. And I realized that the exhibition and that instant could only be sort of like an initial working through ideas. And so the zine be became a place for me to in realizing that the content of the project because of the informality of the zine's production was a way to hold all this material. And in making that zine, it helped me realize what the final project would be. This is an installation later on in Minneapolis in the uh, winter of 2011 um, at Franklin Artworks, where you can see the, um, the way of kind of like working through zine material, which um, is sort of present in these boxes and on these tables became the the centerpiece of the of the installation and this is something that's kind of continued on with with um with projects like bringing um all of that kind of like energy and that ability to return to and shuffle and rework content um not just in the pages of zines but into the space of exhibition this is a i found this snapshot of my of this studio that I worked in for a winter while um, finalizing the studio workbook. Um, uh, Felix would meet me here and we would sequence and edit and it was a really fun uh, 
process. Um, this is uh, kind of giving you an idea of what became the final studio workbook. Um, and then that exhibition continued to travel and we can see various iterations here again. Um, what you see on, on these tables is often all of the previous instances of editing and content and material. And I, and I still return to this um, to this day. But then this leads off to sort of like the last type of, um, of self-published project that I've been doing, which is began in 2013 with this book, this book, which is not a produced book. It's a single object. Um, a single artist book called Some Recent Pictures, a journal. Um, and what it does is it holds together these informal, just like laser prints, Xeroxes, ephemera, notes, etc., of work that I've been making itinerantly for a few years between 2011 and 2013 when I was without a studio. And so this, um, and then this, this book itself was indexed. I actually presented it at the 2013 New York Art Book Fair um, as sort of like a single object. Anyone could come up to me and chat at my booth and I would kind of go, I would flip the pages and we could talk and, um, you know, but, but the work is not available for, let's say, people to kind of like peruse. And it's become an on, it's become the formation for an ongoing archive um, of, of, uh, of content. I can, kind of talk more about that. Um, but there are now, this was the first volume of this work. There are now 10 volumes um, and they continue to be the repository of all of the um, sort of like fragmented content that you find in my current work. So now on to our, uh, the book with, um, for Cam. So I'm gonna go through here and just to kind of give you a sequence of how it unfolds as we begin with these conversations with, um, with friends, everyone who has a relationship to the work. So, you know, um, uh, there's this conversation with Wilson, um, uh, Evan, Evan Moffitt, Grace Wells Bonner, Ariel Goldberg and Malik Gaines have all sat for work and so they, it was important to bring them into the conversation of having both been on that side of the process as well as ha us having been in conversation around work for years. For example, um, Ariel and I go back, um, oh gosh, almost 20 years. Um, we went to undergrad together and they've been someone I've had really generative conversations with over the years. Um, Malik is someone, is a friend who's been in work over the last decade as well. And so, um, Wissan can talk more a little bit more about this, but we decided to um, have the, the, the exhibition unfold um, relationally rather than chronologically, um, kind of coming into recent work, um, some of the most recent work, and then kind of like opening up to this kind of fragmentation. You see, this is a, a crate of some of the studio work material along with some of this collage work collage type work. Um, but then we, we kind of like wanted to settle onto the, some of these original portraits. That was such an important part of, um, of, my, of my early work. And it, I also wanna say this was the first time that any of these images had been shown in exhibition. Um, here are some of these. Okay, and further, you know, here we have some work from 2015 or so, along with uh, an excerpt of the studio work project from 2010. And so the book kind of follows along these similar strands. Here's the installation of studio work. And here it is in the book as translated. Um, and this is where I'm going to kind of leave it off, you know, um, here's some more views. Looks. And then I just want to end it with a couple of install shots from the Blaffer Museum. 
um, where we were able to expand the exhibition with a few additional works. Um, and we were able to, um, with the kindness of um, my friend Darren Klein here in LA, who's, who's had every one of the old zines, he lended um, those original um, additions for us so that they could be seen there in Houston. So I'll hand it off to Wasan. Thanks, Paul. Um, I think what my contributions will be tonight are just to kind of maybe zoom out just a little bit and talk about some of the intentions around the exhibition and the publication. Um, and I think that one of the things I wanted to share was to kind of think about, um, I was interested in thinking about how we could have a deeper kind of understanding of Paul's practice. Um, that was sort of the intentionality of when I think when I first reached out Paul and you know I was thinking a lot about how in the instances where I've seen Paul's work it's often been one particular project or work from one particular series um, and uh, I was really interested in what happens when we can bring a number of different works together over a period of time, you know, I think we said the show covered about 13 years of your practice, um, mm -hmm. to look at how there can might be conversations and connections between the different series and projects that you're working on. So, you know, some people um, may know this, but Paul is often working in multiple series that um, are open-ended. So um, he's often going back and like, you know, continuing that work, right? Um, and so that was one of the reasons why we didn't approach the exhibition layout chronologically because you know the work you don't approach that work in that way and so it would feel kind of um, disingenuous to to do that in the exhibition um, and I, I think that there were some really wonderful moments in the exhibition that I even myself didn't foresee until all the work was in the space um, I know that right from the beginning, I was really interested in showing those early portraits um, because I think that, um, I think I had the perception that some people saw those as separate from the other works that you're making, but I see them as so integral and really one informing the other. Um, and I think when you're in the exhibition and hopefully the book does that also, is it, it sort of opens up all of these connective tissue possibilities that may not happen if you're only experiencing like one, a work from one series. Um, and so maybe like in one image, you see like the orange peel and in um, another image, it's like the residue of like the, the dried out orange peel. And I think there's something really um, nice about seeing time um, like, like almost visually, um, you know, unfold as you went through the exhibition and looked at some of the works. Um, and to see things like in the early portraits, the way in which even fabric played a role. I mean, and this is me as like kind of being the character projecting into this, but, you know, seeing like in a lot of cases, um, those photographs, people were in, you know, your sitters were usually in a bed and there's some kind of either sheets crumpled or, and those things like kind of relate to some of the later work when you start looking at dark room or sort of how fabric kind of finds its way. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that the exhibition was really this opportunity um, you know, we do all this work to prepare an exhibition, but I actually think a lot of the work happens after the exhibition opens when you're in the space with the objects and you start to find these like really wonderful connections between the work. So I think that was something I wanted to share. And I, I think that the intentionality around the publication as you've shared already, Paul, you know, I think that um, I was familiar with some, but not all of the zines that you had produced. I hadn't, you know, they're not very easy to find. And if you try, you can find them for a lot of money on the internet right now. <laughs> so I remember I asked you to send me a few and I had, I think I had one or two, but yeah, I, I think that, you know, I knew that the, the, the zine format and that kind of, um, you know, it too is, is so much not, it's not separate from your making practice, you know, and you've, you've sort of really explained that, I think, yeah. in, your, in your remarks. And that kind of sense of thinking about also, I was realizing this as I was thinking about some of our comments for tonight is, you know, literature has often played a very important, has played a very important role in your practice too. And that also takes a form of some kind of, you know, 
book. And so I think like the book, the zine, the, you know, the, the, that kind of vessel has played a role. And so I was really excited from the pretty, pretty much from the beginning. I said, if we're going to do an exhibition, I really want us to do a publication. And I think that kind of um, bringing in the voices of sitters and, and people in your community, in your life, in, you know, in your orbit was important as well to me because I think that that spirit of community and that spirit of collaboration and also the way in which these relationships develop over time, you know, um, I'm really lucky that I've had a chance to be in the studio with you, Paul, and look, and you can see that, you know, there are images of some of the same people appear over time in the same way the orange peel does, you know, in the yeah. same way these, you know, pe you, you recognize sitters over time. And so that I think that sort of connection to people and that sort of spirit of collaboration was really important. So I wanted to have your voice and, you know, but I also felt like it's, it would be really helpful for a reader who could pick this up, could access moments of those connections or, or relationships that you have with a range of different people who have served as inspiration or collaboration or, you know, and I think everyone who's, who's involved in sitting for an image that you make is a collaborator. And I think, um, and I think that bringing that, those voices in was um, a very deliberate intention in the way that we thought about the publication. Um, so I think those are kind of, I mean, I, you know, I think those are some of my brief uh, remarks about the exhibition and about the the publication. Um, and I'm kind of interested, I think we sort of wanted to make sure there was lots of time to hear from the, yeah. from the audience. <laughs> so um, I, I'll stop so, there. Do you want me to say something else? Well, could I share one more image yeah. and just to continue off of what you were describing? Um, so I like what you were talking about, I like, I just think of just as the sight lines and those, those relations in the show, like um, this is uh, one more image from the Blaffer show. I'm just putting this one up because it was the most kind of clear way because I like the way that in this image, you can see mm -hmm. how you could sort of stand and look at, you could see um, the studio work project, you can see the zines, and then you can look out at this new work. If you were at the, at the Blaffer and the spot behind you would be the, the portraits, original mm -hmm. portraits, but there's this thing that I think, you know, I've often related it to this idea of like studio time or this way in which like all material can be brought back to the present through processes of like, of incorporation. I'm, I'm really into the idea of like artists citing ourselves and quoting ourselves, but also realizing what happens in, in different translations at different times. And so like, it was really, you know, interesting or important to me that like, for example, you might find um, in this table, all of these portraits and, and, and ephemera from the, from 2010, 11 the studio museum, like, you might find a portrait of my friend Darren or my friend Katie, who then reappear in, for example, um, mm -hmm. a, an image in the dark room project, like 10 years later, you find, you start to look at not only the, abs you start to look at the abstraction in a different way here, when you realize that what you're looking at has content, it's the cut and torn paper. Like I described earlier, mm -hmm. this work finds its way into this current series of of one of a kind artist books I'm making, but that you can look at the texture and surface of this paper and then look at the images, the photographs in a different way and realizing the materiality in them um, was really important to me. Um, yeah, and being able to get us to, to sort of see the type of like embeddedness um, of, of the relationships and of the portraits and of the importance of material across all of these things that like you said, often get so separated out mm -hmm. into sort of like discrete projects. And especially as what happens as one moves <laughs> from place mm -hmm. to place or there's formal shifts or breaks in the work, what seem initially like breaks, um, that there's actually a sense of continuity. Because what happened when the, when the mirror studies and the darkroom project came about, um, there was often kind of like a, 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 a revisionist kind of history going on where the, where the foundation of the of the of the portrait practice and the fact that all of the work continues to be portraits 
was sort of getting lost. So it was really, I really appreciated the way in which you really thought carefully about how, um, how this would be contextualized in the physical space, but also in the book. Um, and also just reach, say, asking me to reach out to friends and like, who, mm -hmm. you know, like to, to not just have it be a, like, like a art historical kind of like, you know, abstract read, but like people who have this ongoing relationship to the work. So anyways, I'll leave that <laughs> there. Yeah, I mean, really, I kind of just wanted to make a zine, but I felt <laughs> like that wasn't the right fit for this project. But it was, yeah, I think that was the idea. It's like, how do we bring those spirits in? And I think you're right. There were many instances, it's hard to capture it in the photographs, I think, but many instances, even, you know, in our, in, like in the installation at CAM where people would say, oh, I can see this image in that image. And I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. that's how this, that's how the artist is working. He is self-referencing there, you know, and I think that uh, even when you think about a viewer who might come in without any knowledge of your practice, you know, I think that's kind of the role I play is like, how do I mediate what your intentions are in the work with the public? And it, it was really nice to be able to point almost just like, you know, look across the gallery and, and make these connections for people and it immediately opened up because I think you're right there is a moment where it, it's sort of like a lot of the a lot of your work I think attention was being put on a particular series of your work the mirror studies without a real understanding of the context in which that work came from and also where it was going and I felt like that was this was an, an opportunity for us to start to open that up and really kind of tease it out. Mm -hmm. And I, this, this is interesting just to say that like with studio work, you know, um, I think maybe you said this, but to kind of reiterate for those that are listening that, you know, each iteration of studio work is different. So like what you, the way in studio work was manifest at CAM when the show traveled to the blaffer, you reinterpreted it again. Um, and also to think about how you take something that appears the way it does in a show and to to translate that to the pages of the book. And I think, you know, um, we had great collaborative spirit between yourself and me and Tom to, to find a solution for it. But, you know, those are some of the things that um, can sometimes be difficult to translate from physical into a kind of, uh, or from a, a three-dimensional gallery space to a sort of two-dimensional book. So, yeah. Um, yeah. This was really, it's, I just enjoy so much being able to return to this and find, like you said, finding connections in the space, like in the moment mm -hmm. that had not been anticipated. Like it's interesting looking back at some of these images from 10 years ago and seeing the connections, like you said, between fabric and material, but then also, you know, the, these were literally the sheets, the worn sheets from my home after the initial set of portraits that migrated into the studio and sort of changed what happened in the studio, um, that this material gets reshuffled every time. But then looking at this and then sort of seeing how these, how these kind of images come about, they come about by time and chance and, um, and actually working with material. Like a, I think maybe one thing that I always like to say too, and we can hand it off to questions, is that all of the work really builds off of like bits of unanswered questions or unfinished or unresolved material from projects that preceded it or by ways in which, I think the zines is a really great example is none of this, none of the work, um, you know, would have moved from this to, I'm just gonna do this scroll, to the zines and then could have made the jump to what happens here if it hadn't been for the portrait being translated into this, this vehicle of, of dissemination and it going out into the world and then producing complications that I then had to deal with. Like, what did it mean for there to be an economy of, in, of images and portraiture in like a queer context, right? Like, how does that work return to me and to the subjects and complicate things? Like this work came from, from trying to solve that question. It's never been solved, right? But again, it was 
a thing that built off of what came before it. You know, this work, the idea of these books came from just returning to the, the way in which I found the, the zines very liberating in terms of not having to worry about whether or not I could afford to make the best quality print or I could have the best camera or get lab or darkroom access. It's like, well, I have what's at hand. This is a response to not having a studio. Like all of this, all of the work really has built off in an organic way rather than sort of plotting it out. So I don't know what's gonna come next, um, but I think that always kind of keeping in mind this, this relationship between material and publishing, self-publishing mm -hmm. and like what you, we don't anticipate that reveals to us an exhibition as being something really generative. But we're, I'm talking too much and I want to leave it to um, questions. We may. Thanks. Well, can I ask a quick question about the like archive books? Like you mentioned that it was like ongoing. Is that something that is just a part of your studio practice now? Like you refer back to it or mm -hmm. in terms of adding to it, it's just like is the next page that you insert something into and oh is, I mean they just start from piles of stuff. Piles, piles yeah. of printouts. It might be like just making laser prints and Xerox is a, is a really easy way to edit. Mm -hmm. So that becomes something. Sometimes it gets cut up and becomes a new picture. Sometimes it gets archived. I print out all my iPhone photos oftentimes. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing that since I had like a really crappy like uh, Blackberry, you know, and like super low res stuff. Like it's been a place where I can just without any hierarchies, just kind of Got, gather things together. And what I mean by they became a substitute for a studio is rather than having studio walls to pin stuff to, they became bundles of stuff that I could organize and, and binder clip together. And then I needed a way to resolve them. So I, I decided kind of I, at certain points, I would be like, well, no more shuffling. I work with a book binder um, in, uh, there in, in New York in Red Hook, um, Corinna, she, started small editions. Now she's at the Center for Book Arts, but I still work with them. Um, and like, we just sent six more a few months ago to get bound. Um, and then they eventually become indexed. Mm -hmm. So eventually there's this space in which at a certain moment, there's a timestamp of what was happening in the studio. Um, while the content can still circulate in different ways, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a comment from the, the stream that is just more thanks for bringing the zines into this. They're kind of dance between ephemeral and historical, as well as how the projects continue over time and talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Larry Wolf. Yeah, it does feel like a dance. <laughs> um, it's all, you know, maybe one thing also say it's, I, before quarantine hit, I was supposed to go to New York to finally get all of my storage out here to LA, which included all of my original zine material, all my old negatives, all my contact sheets, all these old prints. We finally got them shipped. Um, we found someone, um, an art handler, and she was great, and she packed it up, and we got it here. And so I've, one of the things I've been doing in, in quarantine is... Um, we've been going through the archives of stuff and I've been discovering mock-ups and ideas for zine projects that never got made, like notes and things. And I don't know what's gonna come of that, but it's, but I've been finding like sparks of ideas that I'm still trying to work with now, like in there. So I always recommend for everyone just like, keep, like keep everything, put it in a print file box, like <laughs> put it under your bed, like, that's what I did. And it's, it's, it's continued to be a really generative uh, place. You mentioned in the beginning, like uh, sort of referencing like a flourishing in like the aughts of a new kind of like queer zine culture. 
that you found yourself amongst or you noticed and were like participating in with some like historical different distance from that specific moment. Do you have any reflections on how and why that was going on and like as a medium of choice and and was there people who are catalysts for that or and and just in terms of like looking back on it now and what what was instigating you to make something like that too i mean there were so many catalysts yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like there was this uh uh there was a writer named nick boston and he was the one who introduced me to butt magazine he wrote like a a little you know the hundred word thing, thing in the back of one and you know kind of like made that connection there was meeting and be, becoming friends and you know Brooklyn neighbors with Christopher Scholes when he was interning at Printed Matter and you know making those con and that's how I you know be, got to know Max and AA and and by extension you and you know this whole community um, and I think there was something about this like new wave of also just like social media happening it's it, like, and at the time it felt very confusing because I at first thought there was no historical model for it, but I started getting, and this is what Wasan was talking about, my interest in literature. I found that like there were precedents for this looking through queer literature and the ways in which like, um, also when I talked about like this, the social currency of, of photography, of portraiture, particularly as it moves and is used and manipulated and like reused and stuff in in queer spaces in spaces that are like this coming together of creative and and like creative and like sexual and like collaborative and like all artistic things right that I looked a lot to like the way in which like Truman Capote used photography in like scandalous ways in the 40s you know the ways in which like the diaries of Virginia Woolf and um, would would how she would dis, uh, uh, disseminate gossip through letters, you know, particularly relating to like, should she sit for a portrait by Cecil Beaton? Like she heard from like another gay who just came from an orgy that like, maybe she should, maybe she shouldn't. Like the same things that we were dealing with. And I'm talking about the thing that, that happens as work starts getting out into the world and becomes a platform has always existed in different ways. So it was really helpful for me to look to those. Also the writing of Richard Bruce Nugent, um, this queer black writer in the, in the Harlem Renaissance, super important. And so now it's really funny to look back on this stuff like 15 years later um, cause I often describe if I'm talking to like newer audiences, I'm like, well, the, the, the same thing that we see on Instagram is this is it's just a new iteration of it. Right. It's like the image that precedes content. Yeah. Um, how do we work with that? Yeah. So yeah, it was really great how, like, I think we were able to bring this together in those conversations with the song and how the, and how the, the, the exhibition and the book actually are laid out to, to suggest those things. That's cool. That lends itself to another question that came in um, from Eric Carroll. It's great to see examples of how zines and books have affected your exhibition installations. I'm wondering if your exhibition strategies have ever formed the way you create and structure your books. Oh. Um. I have yet to make a book in, well, I think perhaps the, the Studio Museum project was a way of like sort of the um, realizing that the book would be the place where the, that, that in a sense brought together or made coherent a project that at the time of exhibition, I didn't even really understand myself or have a grasp on that having the space of a book was really helpful in that um you know I think also every exhibition if it's a good one it feels like oh yeah this I really love it but you also see the things that you'd like to add to it or do differently um I don't know I wonder what uh, how you know um Wasan's thinking about like how uh how the ideas for the book kind of came up, came about and working on on that with me um, in response to the forming exhibition. 
I mean, I think that, I think it's a different way to answer it for me as like kind of the organizer, you know, I'm, it's not, it's not about my vision. It's about your vision and how do I stay true to your intentions and, um, and present something that feels authentic to you, you know? Um, so it, it's not so much about like what I particularly want, although I think the, the things that the vision that is the kind of created as the initial part of a project is sort of, here's what we're thinking, right? We wanna include work from all these different periods because we wanna try to, you know, what I was saying earlier. So um, I think that for, in terms of the, the way in which we, you know, we really laid out the book, the book includes installation images from, from the museum. So the book wasn't actually completed until the end of the run of the exit or actually after our exhibition closed really. Um, and so, you know, there is something about trying to capture the, the way the exhibition, um, because the book in a way also acts as an archive for the exhibition in this, in this instance, which is different than maybe the way that a zine is approached, right? And that's what, that's a one big difference between this publication and say a zine that you're making, yeah. um, the intentionality of it, you know? Um, so I think it's just about going back and forth and finding a really nice rhythm to capture what's in the exhibition, but also let the book have its own identity as well. And mm -hmm. I think that um, through working with, you know, designers and thinking about the layout, you know, and I think um, the way that Tom, who designed the book, approached it is, you know, like we talked about zines and your zine making practice. And Tom looked at that material and he also looked at the images. And I think, you know, if you look at the book, you can see like embedded throughout the approach, the design approach is sort of does have a, a very kind of, it, it is it is informed by the works, but not too informed to be, you know, like too literal, but it, you can feel the spirit of the way in which sort of the lines appear in some of the works kind of reappear even in the cover of the book, the way that, you know, this idea of like, you know, what you, you know, like what you reveal and what you don't reveal, you know, this, the, 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 all of the kind of energy of the work is sort of then found, found, found its way in the design of the book. So, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but. No, it does, yeah, <laughs> it does. It also forces like a type of like temporary categorization. I remember there was like moments where we were like, is this mm -hmm. work part of this body of work or is it part yeah. of this body of work? <laughs> yeah. like, you know, there's always sort of shifting categories. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I found that really interesting as mm -hmm. well, which is something that gets revealed and we can, you know, it gives me a lot to think about to respond to going forward. Yeah. We have another question about, um, let's see. Um, it was interesting to see how your early zines allowed for collaboration between the subject and object. I noticed your portraits in the Whitney Biennial last year and also took on this question of subject object blurring and the question of authorship. Can you speak more about the collaboration and your role as the photographer in your work? Oh, okay. So that's a good question. Um, and how much time do we have? <laughs> I mean, I'm not going anywhere else. We're like all at home in quarantine. So, um, but it, it, it's hard to <laughs> answer. <laughs> like we can go past our time limit. Um, so the work in the Whitney Biennial, I, the way I like to describe it is ideally, um, if, if that work had been presented in another context, it would have been a group show of work by other artists organized by me, um, because it was really important that, um, that the, that, how do I say it? It was the work of 11 artists, friends, um, uh, you know, ranging from artists who've exhibited who are well known to self-taught artists to you know artists who are showing for the first time um two friends who are writers who are who do not consider themselves necessarily visual artists you know but it was i was interested in the type of like entanglement and the side by side working that's present in so much of my of my work um and this was particularly wanting to respond to an image that was in a show the year prior of, it was a portrait 
of a friend taking a picture in my studio. And it was, and he was described in a review of the show as my assistant setting up my camera. When there's two different cameras and we see him actually, his hands on his camera taking the image. And so I was thinking, you know, it, it came in response of thinking about a few years of work that I had had asking friends, okay, rather than me just taking pictures in these setups that I've constructed, you know, you're an artist, you are a photographer, you are someone who has agency and in relation to images, bring your camera, make images alongside me and whatever those may be. I kind of was like, you know, let's, let's kind of like, you know, if there's anything that you really like, share it with me. I'd love to be able to like, put a wild idea out to, to a curator that like, maybe I could organize a show of these friends work that kind of gave more insight to the way all of our work is, is, is entangled together. It's complicated by the fact of the Whitney Biennial being something that's so, you know, hangs on individual names and the idea of who's in and who's out. Um, I really, you know, so um, yeah. So that's the nature of that work. Some of it was, there was a few things that were collaborative. Most of the work was not directed by me, not decided by me. And then there was one or two works of mine. Um, overall in my work, the, the role of, of my role as photographer in terms of collaboration is in some sense, I'm setting up a series of conditions. The show that I had at um, Team in 20, was that 18 or 19? I lost track of time. It was called The Conditions because I was thinking about like, what are the conditions that one sets up for a certain set of circumstances or outcomes to um, unfold? And so I think about this way of shaping conditions, but those also extend into the type of ongoing relationships, friendships, and kind of like, responsibility to images that both precedes and um, and it continues after the making of photographs. Those are those conditions. Um, yeah, that's, I hope I touched on some of the things with that. It's a, it's a really complicated um, question. Um, yeah. There was one comment that said, thank you for mentioning the importance of Richard Bruce Nugent on speaking of the Harlem Renaissance. He was the Re Rene Ricard of that group. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Naming names. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody wanted to know what the soundscape of your studio space when you're shooting. Is it quiet, music, conversation? Does sound and echo influence how you collage your work? Oh. That's not something I've really ever thought about, to be honest. Uh, All that question, I was like, what a good question. I never thought to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Usually listen to anything. Thank you, right now. <laughs> like, you know, um, yeah. or yeah. it's like, it's conversation. Like there's always a conversation happening. Yeah. Um, but the soundscape of my studio is mostly NPR or whatever music I'm listening to because the reality of the studio space is it's 99% of the time it's just me there or me. And now for the last year, I've had a part-time studio manager. So that's the, my, this, the space is not some space just teeming with people bounding in and out, like some, you know, it's not open in any way like that. So a lot of the work I have to say comes from that, the, the time before and after of boredom, of looking, of editing, and then there's these moments punctuated by perhaps another friend being present in the space. Um, but yeah, you'd be disappointed, whoever's asking this question, if they thought it was like exciting to be in my studio. <laughs> it is exciting for all of all of the amazing. I mean, I think the one thing that's incredible is just like. The, num the sheer number of prints that you have, you know, <laughs> that you talked about earlier, like printing everything and just being able to, I mean, I, again, I feel so honored that I was able to like go through those boxes of images and, oh my God, we and did. Yeah. see, I mean, Tell I have more. to say you're also really organized. So I, I mean, I, that is also very impressive. Your, your previous interest and experience in archiving, I think is, is very clear in your, uh, in your studio, but. That's skills learned from day jobs. <laughs> <laughs> 
every, most art, you know, every artist it has a day job. Mine was arts admin and now it's teaching. <laughs> But yeah, art like archiving, organizing was because I generate so much material, it's the only way to be able to make sense of things and to be able to know where to go when I when I'm like making something. I'm like, oh wait, I remember this thing that I did that like where is like how do I find it? Like being able to 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 go to that is is really important. Um but yeah. Yeah, there's one comment that um is the last one that I see is, um, I love the idea of the work having different identities every time it's reproduced through different mediums via collage speaks to the power of changing perspective that photography gives you. So mm -hmm. it's an interesting relation to that line of thought that you were on just now. Yeah. Yeah, things are always just shuffling around. I, some of it comes from, um, and that's why I like to describe, um, and I didn't put images in here, but there was a moment when that happened for me in the zines. So the zines came out of me taking snapshots of all of my work prints on the like light correct, the, the color correction board, you know, like in the dark room. And then being like, why do I have to select one? Like all of these things, even the things that are slightly off all work together for me. Um, then the like the, the type of collage that happens in the current work came from this moment where I realized the first time I had access to a studio through a residency at LMCC, I just used the studio as an office space. I think like most photographers do this. It's like I go out into the world, I make photographs, and then I have this studio that's nice and clean and there's a clean table and like a computer and maybe some like neat push pins and on the wall and like... And, you know, file, like that's what I was doing. And then this moment there's, I, I continued to sort of like occasionally take pictures of just like messes of things piled together before I cleaned them up and organized them. And I looked at one one day and I was like, wait, I think this is work. Like it held together in a photograph, the type of thing that happened in the zines and that set off this way that led to the ideas that I was able to work with at the Studio Museum and before that at the Center for Photography at Woodstock. And, the, you know, so it's like this, that what's described is that like, yes, every time that something is reproduced, it's gonna end up in a different sort of environment and, in a diff and next to something different. And that sort of like thing that I could never plan like that juxtaposition generates new things, you know? Um, yeah. I think that might be a great place to, to punctuate the conversation um, <laughs> and thinking about new things in the future. Um, thank you both for coming together for the conversation. Is there any, any last words that you want to add or should we, would we? Um, um, I appreciate how you thanked everybody related to the book um, and, and thanks for Aperture and Cam for supporting this work um, and, and getting the book out into the world. Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank, thanks to everyone at Printed Matter. I've, um, it's been such an important part of, of like, my whole life as an artist. <laughs> um, I think the very first time, like my, one of the very first times my photos were ever out somewhere in the world was like in a little display case mm -hmm. in printed matter, <laughs> you know? Um, and so it's really wonderful to have like, um, to have just like grown and continued working with now, you know, now um, as a board member, you know, so. I'm always yeah. just encouraged by like seeing all of the amazing like new zine work and like artist books and stuff like that. So yeah, I will say also thank you to Printed Matter because it, you know, has played a role in my work as well for, you know, a really long time. So grateful to have have you as a as a resource and a place of inspiration, I think, for so many of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.